So I have no disclosures to make relevant to this talk or to my next talk on um, pulmonary embolism. Um, just to, you've already heard about what, how to define pulmonary hypertension for the purposes of this talk. I'm really going to be focusing on severe pulmonary hypertension, patients that have got a mean pulmonary arterial pressure of more than 55 millimetres of mercury. Now, I've seen some very sophisticated graphics of the right heart and, right, and pulmonary circulation, and uh, you may have seen mine. Um, this is my way of thinking about the causes of perioperative um, pulmonary hypertension. And these are basically anything that can impede blood flow between the right ventricle and the left ventricle, or left atrium. So these can be diseases of, that affect the pulmonary arteries themselves. They can be uh, vascular or inflammatory diseases, chronic thrombolytic pulmonary hypertension. Um, but acutely, you can also see hypoxic cause, hypoxia, hypercarbonacidosis, cause acute elevations of pulmonary vascular resistance due to stimulation of hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. Now, further down the circulation, you have lung causes of pulmonary hypertension that we see quite commonly in the intensive care environment, patients with severe AIDS, chronic airways disease, interstitial lung disease, and also the way we ventilate these patients is very important as well because if you use very high inflating pressures, high levels of PEEP, Valsalva maneuvers, we can really knock the right ventricle around quite significantly. Now, as, Mitch, as Greg also mentioned in his talk, there are causes distal to the lungs that can cause pulmonary hypertension as well. So anything that elevates pulmonary venous pressures, whether acquired conditions such as mitral stenosis, uh, systolic dysfunction, diastolic dysfunction of the LV, and patients with congenital heart disease will cause elevation of systemic of, of pulmonary arterial pressures. Now, why is this important? Well, it's important really for reasons that have only become apparent for the last 10 years or so. Um, there have been a number of studies over the last decade that have shown that the presence of severe pulmonary hypertension approximately quadruples the rate of mortality from both major um, non-cardiac surgery, patients with, with, that are going undergoing major orthopedic surgery, uh, major general surgery. And they're also, again, fairly recently described uh, quadruples both the short-term mortality from martial valve surgery and uh, the long-term mortality as well. And the long-term mortality is probably increased because of these chronic vascular changes that occur in patients with long-standing pulmonary hypertension. And in a big uh, study of over 100,000 anaesthetics out of, the, out of the Melbourne Children's Hospital, they had uh, 10 pediatric deaths that were solely ascribed to the anaesthetic, which is probably higher than what our surgeons might say. But, and half of those deaths um, underlying pulmonary hypertension was the cause of the acute deterioration. Now, why do these patients die? And the majority of patients, they die because of acute right heart failure. And I think you really need to understand exactly how the right heart fails in response to an elevated pulmonary vascular resistance or an increase in the sarfa load. I think this is very elegantly described in a paper back from 1985. And if you go through this loop, basically, as the, as the right ventricle encounters an increase in afterload, two things happen. It becomes dysfunctional and it, and it dilates. And as it dilates, two other things may happen. The tricuspid valve may become incompetent, decreasing uh, forward flow through the right ventricle, decreasing right ventricular stroke volume, and decreasing blood returning to the left ventricle, left atrial preload. The other thing that happens is the interventricular septum shifts to the left, and this in turn decreases left ventricular preload. Now these combined effects decrease cardiac output and decrease pressure in the aortic roots, which you'll also remember from physiology days, is also affected by the systemic vascular resistance. So vasodilatation also decreases aortic root pressure, which is why it's critically important in these patients that we maintain SVR perioperatively. Now, as aortic root pressure goes down, the inflow pressure for the coronary circulation, for the right coronary circulation, also goes down. And on the other side of the circulation... Sorry, can we put the microphone on? Yeah, sure. Okay. How's that? So on the other side of the circulation, the right coronary circulation is also being assailed by the effect that it's having on the right ventricle itself. So as the PVR goes up, right ventricular systolic pressure also goes up, and this is the downstream pressure of the right coronary circulation. So the driving pressure gradient for the right coronary circulation is the inflow pressure minus the outflow pressure, or right ventricular systolic pressure. And as these levels reach, um, as the pulmonary arterial pressures reach systemic levels, the pattern of flow in the right coronary artery becomes dysfunctionally the same as in the left coronary artery. That is, that it stops 
flowing in, in systole and uh, becomes diastolic dependent. Now at some point as the right coronary uh, driving pressure decreases below a certain critical value, the right ventricle becomes ischemic and then you've got a perfect hemodynamic spiral of deterioration in these patients. And if you've ever seen it happen, it happens very quickly. A patient rapidly go into a PA type of rest with uh, very distended blue uh, heads from, from venous distension, very high right side pressures and uh, can be very hard to resuscitate patients once they've actually entered the spiral. So how can we assess these patients perioperatively? Well, there are really two main ways that we can do it. Firstly, through the use of hemodynamic monitors and secondly, through echocardiography. So the key hemodynamic markers of right ventricular pressure overload is an increased CVP. And this is really the canary in the mine in these patients. If these patients, if you've got a patient with um, with um, a high CVP, it's always a sign of right ventricular dysfunction in these cases perioperatively. If you're measuring pulmonary arterial pressure, it may be elevated, but a falling pulmonary arterial pressure is also a very ominous sign in these patients because it means that right ventricular stroke volume is decreasing, the right heart is failing, and can no longer generate the pulmonary arterial pressures it had previously, so that's a very bad sign. The other very bad sign in these patients is a falling cardiac output. So the combination of a high CVP and a falling cardiac output, by whatever means you measure it, is, is a very critical uh, sign in these patients that the right ventricle is failing. Mean arterial pressure will also start to fall, of course, as this uh, decompensation becomes established. And the other thing that's actually worth pointing out is that um, the mean arterial pressure has a characteristic waveform as well. You get an increase in systolic pressure variation. Now, I used our intraoperative electronic data management capture system, or iPhone, to uh, <laughs> capture uh, the characteristic um, hemodynamics of, of this, this phenomenon. This is a patient, a young patient, that had severe tricuspid regurgitation and, uh, and also an associated pulmonary embolism. CVP is quite high, 25, big prominent V wave we heard about before. But look at the mean arterial waveform, the arterial uh, waveform. So there's marked systolic pressure variation with, with positive pressure ventilation. And this is because the preload to the left ventricle is decreased. Now we hear a lot about echocardiography. I'm just going to give you a few very practical pointers about this. Um, firstly, very occasionally, the echocardiography can diagnose the underlying cause of right ventricular dysfunction if a patient had an acute P, for example. But more importantly, it allows you to assess the integrity of the right ventricle in terms of its overall function, its size, the presence of tricuspid regurgitation, and also how well the left ventricle is coping with uh, its decreased preload. Here's a rather unusual case. This is a patient that presented with uh, acute mass of pulmonary embolus. And uh, this is a, a, bas a basal view of the pulmonary artery here. This is a transesophageic view. This is the aorta over here, superior vena cava there. This is the right pulmonary artery here. And this is a big fat embolus sitting very proximally, including that, that vessel. You don't see that very often. Now I want to show you a few things, a few uh, echoes, just to demonstrate how the, the RV can respond um, in response to this cycle of hemodynamic deterioration I was talking about earlier. This is a 27-year-old patient of ours from a few years ago that was under, undergoing a pulmonary thromboendarectomy for chronic uh, thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. And he had very, very impressive pulmonary pressures, but his right ventricle was coping very well. Here's a TAPSI over here we heard about earlier, nice systolic excursion of the tricuspid annulus. The RV is dilated, but it's contracting very well, so he's very well adapted to this severe pulmonary hypertension. The second patient here has similar levels of pulmonary hypertension, but the RV is clearly struggling. You can see the tricuspid annulus, rather laboured motion here. This is the eyeball test we like to talk about. Um, and there's at least moderate tricuspid regurgitation now. Now this is another patient that was having a pulmonary thromboendarterectomy for chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension who really was at the worst end of the spectrum. Now she um, was only 46 years old. This is a preoperative or pre-bypass echo. And you can see here this right ventricle is enormous. It's huge, blown out. The tricuspid angles, you can't even see it on the screen, but it's hardly moving at all. Severe tricuspid regurgitation. But look at the septum. You can see how it's completely paradoxical. So it's diastole, diastole, diastole. It's been slammed shut slamming the left ventricle and diastole. And here's the transgastric short axis view of the same patient demonstrating how the preload to the left ventricle has been compromised by this massively volume overloaded and pressure overloaded RV. 
So how can we manage these patients, get them through all this? Well, having heard the proceeding, really the chemodynamic goal is fairly straightforward. We try to address all the underlying things we can change. So we try to re reduce right ventricular afterload, maintain right ventricular preload, avoid reductions in, in systemic vascular resistance, which is, I think is critically important. And we can give inotropes to maintain or increase right side contractility. So I mentioned ventilation already. It is very important to listen to your cardiologist when I tell you to avoid hypoxia, do it. And actually, they don't say very much anymore in their consults. We used to drive and this is wild when they did. Um, so um, avoid hypoxia, avoid hypercarbia, avoid acidosis. All these things are bad because they stimulate HPV. And avoid high airway blood pressures. Now here's an illustration of why hypercarbia can be very, very dynamic, have very dynamic effects on, the, on pulmonary arterial pressures. This is a patient with mild pulmonary hypertension, um, mean PAP of 31 millimeters of mercury, CVP of 16, entitled CO2 is 40, and the surgeon just asked us to turn the lungs off while they did a mammary harvest. So we, all we did was make the patient um, hyp hypoventilate for a while and push the CO2 up. Entitled CO2 is now 54, Mean PA pressure has gone from 31 to 44, and CVP has gone from 15 to 20. So you see right away that, that high power ventilation is very, very bad for these patients and can tip patients that are on the downslope of that cycle of hemodynamic deterioration into, into uh, frank failure. There are a few specific anesthetic considerations I'll go to, but not very many. Basically, nitrous oxide is bad for these patients. It increases PVR. Uh, spinal anesthesia is probably also bad because it causes a relatively uncontrolled decrease in afterload, so very rapid onset of systemic vasodilatation that, that can be difficult to turn around if the, if the RV becomes ischemic. Uh, other, in terms of other anesthetic drugs and so on, probably not, doesn't really matter that much what you do, it's really how you do it. What can we do to reduce pulmonary vascular resistance perioperatively? Um, there are non-selective agents out there that decrease PVR, such as calcium channel blockers, uh, GTN and nitroprusside. We don't use these for this indication though because these agents will also all decrease uh, right ventricular uh, right coronary perfusion by producing systemic hypotension, which is a bad thing. Instead, we should use selective agents in patients that do have uh, significant RV dysfunction. And things you can do are to give a high FiO2, which actually does, um, has been shown to re reduce PVR uh, even if the patient is not hypoxic already. Uh, we can give inhaled vasodilators such as inhaled uh, nitric oxide and oil frost, which you're familiar with. You can also basically give any inhaled uh, vasodilator you like, which also, seem, also seems to work. And the effective agents that have been shown to be of use are inhaled milvanone, which we use quite routinely now, our, our, some, of our, some of our patients. Uh, inhaled GTN, uh, oral, sildenafil, and uh, oral bosentan are both highly effective agents at um, selectively decreasing PVR. And more recently, IV sildenafil has be, been approved by the TGA in Australia as well, although it is quite expensive. Now, for perioperative use, um, some centres use Arlaprost, other centres use nitric oxide. I think um, my take on it is that, that of all the perioperative studies that have been performed to date, none of them have shown that, uh, that uh, nitric oxide is superior uh, to Arlaprost. In fact, a few have shown the reverse, and none of them have shown that that uh, there's any advantage of, of uh, uh, that um, there's any advantage of one agent over another. So the advantage of Olaprost, as I see it, is that it's less expensive than nitric oxide for chronic administration. Patients might remain on it for a few days. It's very quick and easy to administer. You set up an ultrasonic nebulizer and uh, away you go. But you don't need specialised monitoring to look after it as well. Now, as I mentioned, maintaining SBR is critically important in, in these patients. It's very important that they don't become vasodilated because that's going to decrease right coronary diffusion pressure. But the other, other benefit of have, it has of, um, uh, if you increase the SVR in these patients, you also counteract some of the interventricular septal shift. So you actually decrease some of the hem hemodynamic effects of septal shift in these patients. In terms of agents that you use, uh, noradrenaline I think is the drug of choice in these patients because it's more effective than the direct acting alpha agents such as phenylephrine and uh, more effectively increases SVR to PVR ratio. And the other agent that we use quite frequently is vasopressin because it has a relative sparing effect of, of, uh, on the pulmonary vasculature and causes quite profound systemic vasoconstriction. So it's a useful second line agent. <coughs> 
In terms of ional traps for RV support, it really doesn't matter what you use, they're all effective. Um, Dibutamine, melanin, levosamine all have the advantage of not only increasing cardiocarpa but also decreasing PVR. There used to be some teaching that adrenaline and noradrenaline were bad in patients that had uh, severe pulmonary hypertension because of increased PVR. But in fact, it has relatively minor effects on PVR because of the predominant effects they have in increasing um, right particular stroke volume. So adrenaline and noradrenaline are good agents to use in these patients. One other thing that's emerged is that it's very useful to use synergistic combinations of drugs that have got different actions. And some of these synergistic relationships that have, that have been shown to be effective include the use of inhaled isoprost and inhaled mirronone. You usually use around sort of 10 units of isoprost plus two, two to, uh, 1 to 2 milligrams of undiluted mirronone. Uh, inhaled nitric oxide and intravenous mirronone also produces a synergistic reduction in, in uh, P PVR without affecting SVR, as does uh, inhaled isoprost and oral sildenafil, and intravenous mirronone and uh, oral sildenafil as well. One combination that hasn't been shown to be effective is the combination of inhaled nitric oxide and inhaled isoprost. So I think you have to choose one of these agents and uh, stick with it. Now, when all else fails, and this is really going to be the focus of my second talk, uh, if you've got a patient that's got acute RV pressure overload that's refractory to maximal medical therapy that's potentially reversible, or the patient is a candidate for a transplant, lung transplant, lung transplant, you need to consider some sort of short-term mechanical support and uh, the default support in most units is being arterial ECMO support in these patients for acute uh, RV decompensation. So to conclude then, it's quite now evident that um, right ventricular uh, or severe pulmonary hypertension is a significant risk factor for acute RV failure in patients undergoing both major cardiac and uh, non-cardiac surgery. Although there's really no evidence to support or to actually um, support this, I think it's, in my experience, it's the patients that have got secondary RV dysfunction that are most at risk. The patient that had the very severe RV dysfunction uh, that I showed you earlier actually had to be crashed on the bypass um, as part of her PT, PTE procedure, which was, wasn't much fun. The key hemodynamic signs of right ventricular failure are an increased CVP and a decreased cardiac output. And I think if you've got a patient that you know has got pulmonary hypertension, that's having major non-cardiac surgery, some sort of, you have to measure the CVP in these patients and some measure of cardiac output, whether you're using a vigilare monitor, whether you're using thermodilution PA catheter or whatever, is actually very, very helpful. So my approach to these patients is really twofold. I think that they sort of fall more or less into two groups and this is why we really want to know from the cardiologist what the RV is like from the preoperative echo. So I think if they've got severe pulmonary hypertension, they've got preserved right ventricular function, the general approach to these patients should be that you avoid doing anything that's going to make the PVR worse. So you avoid hypoxia, hypercardia and all those other things. Maintain the SVR. I don't think it's necessary to give pulmonary vasodilators in these patients, in this group of patients, and there is a downside to doing that in some patients, especially if they've got severe left ventricular dysfunction as well, because if you do give these patients um, how many vasodilators you're going to increase right ventricular stroke volume, increase left side of preload, and you may actually tip them into pulmonary edema. Now, those patients that don't have preserved RV dysfunction, I think are extremely fragile, extremely uh, perilous perioperative candidates. So, if there is right ventricular dysfunction, my approach would be to give these patients pulmonary vasodilators, which can actually start even pre induction, and we often give our PT patients. Isoprost while they're waiting in the anaesthetic bay. Nitric oxide can be started preoperatively, while it's a bit more tricky to administer. They can be pre-medicated with sildenafil, which I think is a bit of a uh, surprise from the, uh, the ward staff. Um, we can maintain RV perfusion uh, intraoperatively with noradrenaline and vasopressin, that's critically important. And we need to maintain right ventricular contractility with inotropes and any of these agents, either alone or in combination, are effective. And finally, if all else fails, of course, consider the ECMO. So the take-home message, I think this is really the focus of this whole day today, but in terms of pulmonary hypertension, I think it's very easy for people to think about the number and you know, whether they've got uh, what that means in terms of their risk stratification. But I think what's really important in these patients is we don't just think about the level of pulmonary arterial pressure, we think about how well the RV is doing and treat the pump and not the pressure. Thank you.